I'm Jenny Thompson. I'm from Knox Social and Community Health. Uh, I work as a coordinator of alcohol and other drug treatment. I've been working in that industry for two decades. Um, very passionate about this work and I'll be talking about trauma in the context of that work. But of course trauma applies to all the service types that you're coming from. It's been an incredibly inspiring morning, hasn't it? Fantastic. So is there someone changing the slides? We can change the slide now, thanks. <laughs> so I'm particularly passionate about uh, reducing stigma for people who use substances and I guess uh, substance use is probably still the most stigmatised issue we have in the community and that's something I'm particularly disturbed about because as we see uh, um, substance use is an incredibly misunderstood community problem and unfortunately individuals get blamed Next slide. I think I'm just going to have to say next slide. So people use substances for a range of reasons. And uh, if, does everyone have a pen? Does everyone have a pen in their show band? We could do a little activity. I know we said this is a workshop. It'll be mainly talking to you. But one little activity I'd like to do to begin with is if you could, um, Take out a piece of paper and a pen. And we're going to do an exercise where you write a sentence with your non-dominant hand. So if you're left-handed, it'll be your right hand. If you're right-handed, it'll be your left hand. And if you could write the following sentence with your non-dominant hand. Human behavior is need driven. Human behaviour is need driven. You can't hear me? Is that better? Okay, come and sit down in the front, there's more resources up here. Sorry about that. So what is it like to write with your non-dominant hand? Uh, Human behaviour is need-driven. It's hard? Yes. Did any of you wonder what's the point of this exercise? Yes. And I imagine that it may have felt confusing or strange. Was there any dialogue happening in your mind? So were you thinking this is stupid or I can't do this? Were you critiquing your writing? What if I said to you, for the rest of this session, you need to take notes with your non-dominant hand? In fact, for the rest of the conference, you need to take notes with your non-dominant hand. Give You'd give up? <laughs> so what would get you to want to do something like that? You'd want to know there's a payoff. A reward. A reward. <coughs> You'd want to know what the purpose of that exercise is. But what we've actually done in a very simplistic way is we've got into the shoes of someone who's told they need to stop using substances. It feels unfamiliar. There's a critique going on, can I do this? And what if you had to do this for the rest of the day? What if you had to do this for the rest of the week? You may experience some terror, you may experience some anxiety. Human behaviour is need driven and we get into our autopilot and we like our routine and we like doing what's familiar, what's comfortable, what's easy. If we need to do anything that takes effort, whether it's changing our diet or our exercise regime, something that's different, that's going to take effort, we need to know there's a payoff, we need to know we can do it, we're capable of it, otherwise we'll just give up. What's the point? And we certainly won't start doing something new just because someone told us to. We need to know that there's something in it for us. So people use drugs for a whole lot of reasons. And next slide, thanks. And what we know as addiction workers, addiction counsellors, 
is that alcohol and other drug use is the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot of other issues going on underneath. And if we solely address drug issues, we're actually not touching the underlying issues. So as a drug treatment service, we often don't talk about the drugs as the problem. We're a health service. We have oral health, diabetes nurses, child protection services, ECASA, uh, family services, child first, all on the same location where we are. When someone comes in the door, they could be coming to get their toenails cut or seeing a dentist. We don't have the shingles up saying we're a drug treatment service. So it reduces the shame. And we try and endeavour to make sure that the person coming into our service knows that there's value in it for them. We're attending to the whole person. Next slide, thanks. What, what we know is that drug issues are a bit like a Rubik's Cube. You move one part of the person's life, it has an impact on another part. And people are not complex, their issues are. So people come with multiple and complex issues and our service sector doesn't respond very well because we're very siloed. And what's exciting about this conference, learning about collective impact, is it's really encouraging us to partner, to work collaboratively, to work on community issues together. So I'm not sure if you know or don't know your alcohol and other drug treatment service providers in your region. Uh, I know many of you are not from drug treatment here, so I encourage you to do that. We partnered with a range of services so that we could attend to all of these issues. Legal services, health services, mental health services, uh, trauma specialists, so that when the person came through our door, we would be able to say to them, welcome, you've come to the right place. We can attend to all of your needs. We may not be able to attend to it all on site, but because of our partnerships, because of our collaborative treatment teams, internal and external to our organisation, we can attend to all of the needs that you bring. Next slide, thanks. So, I'm not sure if you've heard the term dual diagnosis. Um, there's been a massive uh, push from our departments uh, across the country to create co-occurring capable services. If we treat addiction without treating the mental health issue, it's like doing CPR to a headless body. If we attend to one part of the person without attending to other aspects of their life, it's like doing CPR on a headless body. So we need to respond to the person holistically. Next slide, thanks. One of the elephants in the room for many, many years has been trauma. And what we've started to do is we've actually started to screen for, for trauma. So on your CD-ROM, um, you will have our assessment tool and you will see that we assess for trauma. And it's really, really interesting seeing how many people presenting for drug treatment have a history of trauma. We also know that um, the children that you're working with, uh, the adults that you're working with, have experienced trauma and that has massive implications for how you respond to them. Next slide, thanks. So historically in, in drug treatment, the fact that we haven't actually attended to this issue, we haven't named this issue, we've known that it's been there but we haven't asked the question. We don't know what type of trauma it is. It's resulted in trying to put square pegs in round holes. It's resulted in workers burning out. It's resulted in clients being blamed. So for example, we'll use labels such as borderline personality, for example, and handball that client from service to service because they're too difficult or they're too complex in actual fact, they're a traumatised human being. Probably the most traumatised human being you work with. So we no longer put band-aids on gaping wounds. These people are people without psychological skin. So if we're attending to trauma, we're actually going to 
accept that there are certain behaviours that come with having a traumatised condition. So we need to skill up. We need to know how to respond. We know, need to know how to bring healing to someone with that condition, rather than whack a label on them and put them in the too hard basket and further traumatise them. Thanks, next slide. So I really love Lunik and I really love this cartoon. We need an understand scope particularly in re relation to alcohol and other drug issues. I think we've come a long, long way in reducing the stigma for people with mental health issues. I think there is still a perception in the community that drug use, alcohol use, um, is choiceful, uh, that someone has self-inflicted uh, complications because of the choices that they've made. We really need to have a paradigm shift around this. In my two decades of work with AOD clients, they are the most inspirational, brave, inspiring people that I've ever worked with. Uh, I have a team of AOD counsellors who love working with this population because if you create the right condition for them, if you understand that they've come with a history of trauma, you'll create a safe place. You'll create a place where they can open up. You'll create a place where they can transform. Thanks. So this is how we understand it. We understand that human behaviour is need-driven and motivated. There's not much that we will do as human beings unless there's a payoff. So drug use, has a payoff. We have people using ICE so that they get more successful telemarketing outcomes, for example. Or we have directors of company using speech so they can work longer hours. And if I told you the profile of the clients coming to our service, it's really, really interesting if we look at the reasons why they're using substances. Without exception, there is a payoff. Their need is getting met. And so our job is to find out how else could they meet that need? Is this the only way? We all have our addictions and some are more socially acceptable than others. I uh, saw a big line up for the coffee this morning. Coffee's become the latest um, drug for our <laughs> consumption. On my way to work I have six coffee vans. Uh, people have put up their vans because people are prepared to stop on their way to where they're going to pay $4 for a coffee on the way to work. So it, we all have our routines, we all have our autopilot, we all have the things that we become dependent on. And substance use is just one of those. Not all substance use is problematic. Not every parent who uses a substance um, is a danger to their child. Some parents can reduce harm and can actually be quite protective. Not all substance use is a result of trauma. That is true. Thanks, next slide. Next slide, thanks. So, if we're going to reduce stigma, the first thing we'll do is we'll drop the labels. Labels are helpful for professionals. It is helpful to screen and identify particular mental health conditions, personality disorders and so on. It's very helpful, it informs us. It doesn't help the person. Uh, as a, an organisation, we have decided that we will no longer use terms such as smoker, user, addict, alcoholic, schizophrenic. Uh, when I grew up, we use names like spastic and retard. I mean, they're incredibly derogatory labels. Labels really do not do anything to give dignity to human beings. So we use person-centered language. A person who smokes cigarettes, a person who's dependent on heroin, a person who has diabetes, a person with schizophrenia. And I think by changing that language, we actually do a lot to bring dignity and support to the person. Uh, but we're also naming 
the issue as it really is. The person is not their behaviour. The person is not their diagnosis. So when we're educating our clients about this, they start to see, well, I am more than this condition. I am also a mother. I am also a sister. I'm also um, a child of someone. I like to garden. I like to do other things. So they start to explore other aspects of their life and get meaning and purpose. Shame is the fuel of addiction. It keeps them trapped in addiction. Often our clients think that they have um, no hope. They believe that they're flawed, that they're somehow bad, that they're a burden to society, and that keeps them trapped in rebellious behaviour. So stopping the labels really enables us to respond more respectfully reduce shame and become more sensitive to the person that we're working with. I really like the use of metaphors. We, we use ACT therapy at Knox and one of the metaphors that's come from uh, ACT therapy is a person is not a maths problem to be fixed and solved. Our mind is a problem solving organ. We like to categorise, we like to have a formula but a person is not a maths problem. They're like a sunset that needs to be admired. We don't say to the sunset, you need to be redder, more orange, more beautiful. We sit there in awe and admire the sunset. If we were to treat human beings in the same way, we would actually see incredible strengths. We would actually see things that we hadn't seen before. Thanks. So I really like this um, quote from Peter Levine. Uh, Peter Levine is uh, quite a guru in the trauma world. Some of you will know Peter Levine and his work. Trauma is the most avoided, ignored, denied, misunderstood and untreated cause of human suffering. Trauma for many results in suffering from debilitating symptoms in the aftermath of perceived life-threatening and overwhelming experiences. Addiction to substances being one of many ways of managing the aftermath. Human beings are born with an innate capacity to triumph over trauma. Trauma is curable and the healing process can bring about genuine transformation. So our, what we have done as a team is really worked very hard to become trauma capable. Not just trauma informed, I think trauma informed is uh, really building the capacity to create safety, to be able to respond respectfully and understand how to uh, help someone to feel safe. But being trauma capable is actually being able to process the trauma, to actually do the therapeutic work. Um, and we're doing that in a number of ways, which I'll talk about shortly. Next slide, thanks. So we know that um, trauma has an impact on the whole person and there's attachment trauma, there's developmental trauma, there's trauma at different stages of life and trauma impacts every aspect of the human being and their life. So we need a whole person response. Uh, as an addiction treatment service for many, many years we've talked about having a biopsychosocial response. If we're not attending to the biology, the psychology and the social networks of an individual, we're not going to get very far in drug treatment or drug treatment counselling. We've now added to that spirituality. So we're a biopsychosocial spiritual treatment service. And what I mean by spiritual is we're exploring people's values, their meaning and purpose in life. What do they really value? So, for example, someone who has had their children removed from them, we will be working with them to see what's important to them. And, of course, they always say, my children. So we might say, your children are more important to you than anything else. So we're, they're the juicy carrot out here, your children, your values. But you keep going on a detour loop. You keep doing things that take you away from that which you value. 
What would you be prepared to do to stay on track with your values? What would you be prepared to do to move closer to your children? So we'll strategize how do they actually live by their values. And this is actually working for us. Um, so we're attending to value exploration. And we're also doing work around valuing their role as a parent and what that actually looks like. Many of our clients have never had uh, positive role models. So learning how to actually parent, what it means to create safety for their children and how to put their children's needs first is often uh, really, really challenging for them. Next slide, thanks. We've gone backwards, sorry. Um, much of the violence that plagues humanity is a direct or indirect result of unresolved trauma that is acted out in repeated unsuccessful attempts to re-establish a sense of empowerment. So what I, where I've seen this in play is when I've worked with clients who come out of prison, for example, clients in the criminal justice system, who come with a long list of um, violent behaviour or aggression. And now that we're looking at trauma, we're actually seeing that these human beings have had significant trauma in their life. And they're actually stuck in the fight-flight mode, which is the fight mode. And the way in which they operate in the world is in hypervigilance and aggression, because that's how they get their empowerment. So we work with them around the anger iceberg and help them to see that anger is the tip of the iceberg. It feels powerful, it feels great to overpower someone when they've felt so disempowered. But underneath, uh, there are a whole lot of vulnerable feelings that they don't want to actually feel. Feelings such as sadness, powerlessness, uh, grief, anxiety. And supporting them to actually connect with a vocabulary of feelings to have the safety of trauma processing where they're able to join the dots around why they're stuck in, in fight mode, why they're aggressive. Um, and so this is actually how we create safe communities. We don't label someone as too difficult, too hard, too aggressive, bad. Their behaviour is need driven, so we need to understand what their behaviour is about. Next slide, thanks. So what we know is when there is a trauma, there is a stress pile-up. And that people often uh, end up in either hyper-alert or hypo-alert. If they're in hypo-alert, they're daydreaming, they're staring, they're, they're freezing, they're in the freeze mode. And if they're in the hyper-alert, they're more prone to be aggressive. And as we see stress pile up and unbearable emotions, people will turn to substance use. So they will self-destruct or they will destroy others or they will isolate. They will choose a path of managing their emotional distress. So most of the people we see are in the self-destructive mode or destructive mode. They harm others because that's their way of not feeling. Or they harm themselves. And occasionally we will see those who retreat, who are suffering from dissociative disorders. Um, and they may also use substances as well. Next slide. When we first started our trauma work, we took a snapshot of 140 of our clients. And what we found was very, very interesting. We expected that there would be a high prevalence of anxiety and depression. Uh, and as you can see, they were the highest, anxiety being the highest. But interestingly, if we combine the other two highest scores, one was trauma, one was complex trauma. We differentiated them uh, by saying complex trauma was significant childhood trauma and developmental trauma or attachment 
uh, trauma. And the trauma column was a trauma event happening to them as an adult. So if we combine those two columns, that would be actually the highest prevalence um, of experience that someone coming to a substance use service uh, is experiencing. Our clients are survivors of childhood trauma. If someone had intervened early in their life, they may not be our clients today. And that's a real concern to us. I've been in adult work most of my working career. Coming to this conference and hearing the presentations this morning, I've been sitting there thinking, we've got to intervene earlier. Because the people that I'm working with, when we do their life history, when we, we do their map of substance use, they've had an early experience of trauma or difficulty with no intervention. I loved what Michael um, said this morning about the random opportunity. There's been no random opportunity for these clients. The random opportunity is they've turned up on our door and we believe that we can make a difference. And we do. People are transformed. We had a group of our clients uh, present at a conference with us recently. We had a group of our clients deliver a three-hour workshop to over 100 staff at Knox Community Health on what it is like to have a co-occurring mental health and substance use condition. And they were inspirational. If we give them the opportunity, if we believe in them, if we create safety and compassion, it is incredibly inspiring to see what human beings can do. They can actually thrive. Not just survive, they can thrive. We had a group of our clients last week take a chartered bus uh, full of mental health workers, uh, AOD workers, inpatient mental health nurses, and our clients were the tour guides, and they took them on an orientation of the region and of all the services in our region. Clinical mental health, community mental health, AOD, detox, uh, inpatient unit at Maroondah. They talked about what it was like for them to access those services. And it was inspirational. We really need to hear the voice uh, of the person who's experiencing substance use to really understand them, to really know what it's like for them to access the service and to hear how challenging it is for them, to see how far it is they have to travel to get to a detox, to see that many, many times they've had to sit through assessments answering the same old questions and the undignified experiences that they've had to survive and yet they still pick up the phone and ask for help. They still present at your service for help. They are incredibly inspiring. So very keen to have early intervention. If you're working with children, congratulations. You've got such an exciting job and uh, it's very inspiring that you're doing this work. The other elephant in the room is vulnerable children. Now, historically, I'm ashamed to say that we haven't been very family inclusive as an AOD service. Um, when I first started in the field, family was the problem. <laughs> we protected our clients from their family. Um, and I'm ashamed to say that. We've come a long way. We're, we're really working very hard to have a family inclusive approach, to bring family members in. When they're doing a genogram, who else would you like included in your treatment plan? Would you like them to come to a session? And we find the other side of the story. We find how incredibly patient the carers have been, the, the siblings have been, the spouses, um, the parents. Uh, and we're really addressing the family system. But the other elephant in the room for us has been the vulnerable children. We've known that our clients have had children, but we haven't seen them as our clients. And that's a big shift for us as, a, as a, an addiction sector. We are now asking the question, how many children? How old are they? Um, 
How are you protecting them? Do you have a protective plan? When you're using a substance, where do they go? Who are they with? So we are now seeing children as our clients. So every person that's coming to substance use treatment, when we do our assessment, we see their children as our clients and we let them know that. We let them know that we'll be working with child protection and child first and family services and that we'll be ensuring that they have the resources they need to ensure those children are safe because we need to ensure that our clients' children are not our future clients. And we haven't been very good at that. We've seen generational drug use. We've had clients whose mothers have scored for them, whose mothers have injected them, whose mothers have introduced them to cannabis for the first time. So we need to ensure that we're addressing the whole family and preventing future trauma to children. So in your CD-ROM, you'll have, next slide, thanks, a range of um, screening tools that we use. So we, we screen for mental health, we screen for oral health and general health needs. Um, we do a full drug history, of course and we're looking at the family system. When we're preparing a care plan, we're looking at what their goals are in relation to their vulnerable children or their family. We have numerous referral pathways. As I said, uh, Community Health has a range of health services on site. We have a CASA on site. We have a mental health nurse on site. Uh, we have partnerships with community mental health and clinical mental health. So we're making sure that the issues identified at assessment are taken care of in the treatment planning. And every question we ask is in the service of the client. We do not ask one question unless it's of service to the client, unless it's helping them become more self-aware or unless it's helping them to identify a goal towards their wellbeing. Thanks. So the first thing we do is identify their drug issue, their health issue, their oral health issue, their family issue, uh, their vulnerable children issue, their mental health issue. And then we create a plan. Where there is trauma, which is in the majority of our clients' cases, the first step is creating safety. We're creating a compassionate, ideal parent relationship with our clients and we want them to internalise that ideal parent. So they're incredibly hypervigilant if they've experienced trauma, so creating safety is extremely important, teaching them to breathe. I don't have enough of them but we do what's called a flashback protocol for PTSD um, and if you'd like to take any of the resources up here, please help yourself, and if you miss out, let me know. There are a range of techniques that we can use to help uh, ground someone, uh, encourage calm. So our, our first priority is calming, providing self-soothing, self-regulation skills, calming skills, so the person feels safe and able to proceed in treatment. We have a number of referral pathways uh, for trauma work as well, and we have two of our staff trained in EMDR, which is eye movement desensitisation, and uh, that's a technique that helps our clients uh, process their trauma, but most importantly, um, create a place where their dysregulation is stabilised so that they can do the work so that they're no, no longer overly distressed or hyper aroused. We then have a collaborative shared care plan, so that's using all of the partners we have internally and externally to provide a shared care team. And we call that team the cheer squad. So uh, in terms of what the person understands that team to be, that is their cheer squad. We're there to help them achieve their goals. And of course, we evaluate the outcomes. Next slide, thanks. 
So, anyone familiar with John Breer's work? So, John Breer is, is another guru of trauma. And John talks about good therapy needing to honour and acknowledge that the survivors are competing, have competing needs to maintain safety and internal stability while at the same time being open to experience and information so that he or she may heal and grow. So next slide. So what we talk about is the window of tolerance. We need to keep our clients in the window of tolerance. If they get hyper aroused, they're not actually going to be able to do any therapeutic work. They're going to be hyper vigilant and anxious. If they're hypo aroused, they're actually going to dissociate. So we need to keep them in the window of tolerance and we do that by using flashback protocol, grounding techniques, self-regulation, breathing, calming, um, calming interventions. Uh, one of the um, methods that we've implemented over the last five years is mindfulness uh, therapies. So mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, mindfulness-based relapse prevention. We run uh, a mindful, mindfulness meditation group weekly. So our clients are actually able to come and practice their mindfulness skills. And this really helps to keep them in the window of tolerance so that they um, can manage their distress. So they're no longer using alcohol to feel calm. They're no longer using heroin to feel calm because they've found an alternative. They've found another self-regulating, self-soothing way of managing that. Next slide, thanks. So I've mentioned our, our therapies, uh, DBT. Of course, we use um, DBT, acceptance and commitment therapy. Our whole team trained with Russ Harris and Louise Hayes over a five-year period. That is our, um, one of our preferred methods, along with mindfulness methods, and it's working extremely well for substance use issues and co-occurring mental health. Uh, we use art therapy. Schema therapy is particularly important, and in your CD-ROM you'll have uh, a schema therapy booklet. We have the schema therapy questionnaire, which um, our clients fill in, and it identifies what their schema is. So their schema is their entrenched story. Now, if you'd like to Google schema, you can actually do your own schema questionnaire, find out what your own schema is, and um, the schema therapy booklet might support you. Every intervention we do with our clients, we have done with ourselves. We have processed our own trauma as a team through mandala work with ACASA. We've all done our own schemas together. Um, we've applied a whole lot of the tools that we use with clients to ourselves because of course they apply to ourselves. Uh, human beings are human beings and we have all sorts of um, destructive ways of managing life, whether it's the not good, good enough story or something else that's actually prohibiting us from being all that we can be. So it's very important as workers that we know something about what it's like to experience the intervention and then we can uh, apply that intervention with great inspiration and um, transparency. So I mentioned EMDR and of course CBT, which we know has been around forever. Thanks, next slide. Um, another website you might like to look at is the self-compassion uh, website of Dr. Kristen Neff. Uh, we contacted Kristen Neff to ask if we could use the self-compassion scale. It's also on your CD-ROM. Every client um, fills in this questionnaire and of course we have filled this in with ourselves as well. So the questionnaire is looking at what is the quality of relationship with yourself like? What is the quality of relationship with yourself like? And once you look at that, you realise that drug use actually is quite a self-destructive behaviour. It's not a self-compassion behaviour. So if we were to become more self-compassionate, we may not participate in self-destructive behaviour. So there are three main aspects of self-compassion that Kristen Neff encourages us to cultivate. Mindfulness, um, common humanity, and social connectedness. So um, you'll have a look at her website. There's lots of PowerPoint presentations that Kristen's got on there to explain 
um, this method with you. But self-compassion is a therapeutic intervention and it's something that we encourage our clients to um, cultivate in their life. Self-compassion is curative and self-compassion is the language we use rather than self-esteem. We no longer use the term self-esteem since we've um, done some training with Kristen Neff. Self-esteem has a whole lot of other problems with it and if you look at her website you, you'll see that um, in her PowerPoint presentations. Next slide, thanks. Um, the other people that have influenced our work is uh, Ken Minkoff and Christy Klein, two psychiatrists from the States. I went over to the States and presented at uh, their conference on um, the Minkoff and Klein implementation in our service. Um, Ken and Chris are incredibly inspiring. They are working to change systems, policies, procedures to become more welcoming. So next slide. Um, Ken has uh, developed 12 steps for workers and 15 steps for organisations. They're also on your CD-ROM. It guides you into how you can develop an organisation that is compassionate, welcoming, empathic and hopeful. Imagine a hospital system if it was welcoming, empathic and hopeful. Imagine a mental health system if it was welcoming, empathic and hopeful. Imagine your service if it was welcoming, empathic and hopeful. These are the underlying principles of our service. We've now implemented these in our policies, in our procedures, in the way we do business. Um, our front desk receptionists are welcoming, empathic and hopeful. Our diabetes educators are welcoming, empathic and hopeful. Our oral health team are welcoming, empathic and hopeful. So if we um, look at these simple but profound principles, we actually can transform the experience of the person who is accessing our service. Um, and you'll have a number of their resources on the CD-ROM. One of the things we, we did um, in partnership with Ken, who we've been mentored um, by for a number of years now through teleconferencing, is we've established a case presentation Profile. So whenever we're presenting a case about the client, we'll use that um, template, it's on your CD-ROM. What it gets us to do is to talk about the strengths of the client. What are the resources and strengths that they have in the face of their adversity? What have they done to be resourceful? And it really turns the way we view our clients. Uh, it turns it on its head, actually. We can, in supervision, become quite despondent about the complexities of someone's life and wonder how on earth we can uh, respond to them. If we take this template and, and answer the questions um, on the template, we actually start to see that this person is incredibly resilient and they actually have the resources to transform their lives. So um, it does put a hopeful slant on things. Thanks, next slide. So just to finish, uh, Raymond Geisha, another great inspiring uh, guru. Human beings are precious, they are ends in themselves, they owed respect, possess inalienable rights, inalienable dignity, and be that as it may, each one of them is problematic and contentious. I'm sure you've experienced that um, with the people that you work with. And they are incredibly inspiring if we can take a strength-based lens. Uh, are there any questions before I allow you to come up and help yourself to resources? Yep. Hi. Um, I don't think anyone can hear me, but we work with you. Sorry. Um, you work with young people? Don't give me a mic. I love to see you. Yeah. Um, we work with you, um, who are like and not only parents, um, sort of keep them out and give it up on them and there's a lot of drug and alcohol issues particularly ice that we're seeing at mm -hmm. the minute um, we don't have any detox or rehab centres here in Tasmania no detox? No. no rehab? no wow so I'm wondering if you have any suggestions <laughs> wow I'd love to wave the magic wand um, 
I think it, we need to lobby. We need to get the voices of the young people um, talking to local members. I think what you're getting a lot of at this conference is around collective impact and really taking, um, getting organisations together to deal with community problems. So that is a community issue um, that really needs solving. It's appalling that you don't have a detox yep. and a rehab. Yep. I didn't know that, really. We have, we have for older people. For older people, yeah. but not young people. Okay. Wow, okay. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's certainly an, a really important um, community issue to address. As I said, people are not the problems. It, it, it's actually the systems. The, the fact that you, you do not have that service is actually letting those young people down. Yeah. Mm. Other questions? Self-regulation skills are the most important um, skills. Safety, calm, uh, mindfulness, meditation, um, sensory, um, a sensory room, um, you know, having tactile, working with the senses. So taste, smell, touch, working therapeutically with the senses, I would say. I think trauma work is something that um, we, we really need to get into. Um, a couple of years ago, we embarked on becoming a trauma-informed service and we decided we need to be trauma-capable. It's not enough to be trauma-informed. So I think um, look into trauma courses as specific to children because there's a lot out there. There's so much out there. Um, sorry? Play therapy, play, drumming, arts, um, music. Yeah, so we're using all of the, the mediums that would be suitable for children. We're using with adults because they're traumatised children in an adult body. So we're using drumming, we're using art. Um, we, we have a sensory room. Um, so, yeah, that, that would apply to children as well. That's fantastic. I think, as I said earlier, um, around you know, adults getting put, you know, square pegs in round holes and, and blaming um, people is, is probably happening with children as well. And you know, we really need to become far more skilled at, it, at attending to trauma and understanding behaviour as trauma behaviour. All human behaviour is need driven. What's driving you crazy is keeping them sane. So, you know, for us to become really skilled at creating calm environments, becoming really skilled at being able to teach a child or an adult self-regulation, self-soothing, um, calming kind of skills, breathing, it's the simple um, breathing exercise of being able to calm yourself, putting your hand on your heart and knowing um, what it's like to self-soothe by, by touch is something, you know, we've, we've used that intervention with people coming out of prison. 
um, and to, to, to good effect because no one's ever taught them to self-regulate. No one's ever taught them that they can calm themselves. Um, and we apply this to ourselves when we become stressed. Um, knowing how to self-regulate ourselves, knowing how to calm ourselves, knowing how to talk to ourselves kindly. Um, how many of us have the not good enough story? I know that we've asked that question um, with hundreds of health professionals and there's no one that can put their hand up and say they don't have a not good enough story somewhere going on in the chatterbox of the mind. Um, we, we are our worst enemy. Our mind is not always our friend. And, and all of the self-regulation, self-soothing, calming interventions that we learn about to apply to our clients, we can apply to ourselves and prevent burnout as well. So, um, you know, I guess the other message I would say is create self-caring environments, uh, trauma-informed environments for yourselves as workers and ask for that from your managers as well because vicarious trauma uh, affects you if you don't have those skills. I don't know how long I've got. I think I've covered my time. Yeah. You have, but I'm sure we'd all like to thank Jenny and thank you so much for bringing not just yourself and your wisdom but all the resources that you've left and there's more up the front. I know this session was due to finish at quarter past two and then we're just progressing back through to the main auditorium. But join with me in thanking Jenny. Thank you.